Welcome back um, for the discussion panel that will conclude today's session of Food Sense. Um, I'm just going to quickly reintroduce our speakers. Um, Shirley Corrier, William Miller, Jonathan Justice, Paul Breslin, and we have a new member who's joined us, Daniel Pliska, and he is the executive chef at the MU Alumni Center, and he's going to just share a few words with us, and then we'll open up the session to question and answer like we have been doing. So, Daniel. How's everybody doing out there? Oh, too loud, huh? <laughs> I guess it's the, the, the amplification is a little bit more than I anticipated. Uh, well, I'm honored to be here with uh, these uh, learned and uh, experts in food and, uh, and, and academics and, and so on and so forth. And I, I just came today basically to talk a little bit about the professional chef field and about why chefs cook, how we cook, and uh, just basically about food in, in from the chef's point of view, the professional chef's point of view for the artistry of the food, how it looks, uh, how it tastes, is really the number one concern that most chefs have. And I know this is a symposium, it's my first time, so I, I'm not really sh clear on what we're all gonna talk about, but I just, from my point of view, I, I wanted to bring some things and talk about that. I do that have a PowerPoint, but I understand the, the screen is a little bit in your face, if you will, so uh, uh, you probably won't be able to see that today, but it will be on the website. Uh, for some different points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, some of the points that I wanted to talk about today were, again, you know, why, why chefs cook? Well, we, we cook for passion. And uh, I'm sure John, uh, Jonathan, Chef Jonathan will tell you the same thing, and, and other chefs that are, that are here are, are, will all say the same thing. We cook for passion, we cook for sustenance, we cook for art, and last but not least, we cook for money. And that right there is probably one of the biggest problems when we talk about when people ask us about food and nutrition in the, in the country and as, as a society and how to get it better. Uh, when, when money comes into the, the equation, you know, we have to cook. Maybe we love certain, to cook certain things or we know what's good for people to eat, but if people come to our restaurants or to our kitchens or to our dining facilities and they want a certain thing, we have to cook what they want. Otherwise, we won't, or we won't have a job. So it's very important to, to understand that. Just like vegetarian, veg we all know the plant-based diets, Vegetarians is a better way to live than eating high fat, a lot of meat, so on and so forth. But I can tell you, we cook for a lot of vegetarian dishes, but if, when I put them on my menu, if I put a vegetarian fare, we don't sell that many of them, you know, unless people know it. And, and unfortunately, we as chefs, we have to, we have to cook for the, what the market demands, what people look for. People come to restaurants, high-end restaurants, and to fine dining facilities, mostly, mostly I, I say, for special occasions, okay? And most people in this country, in our society, don't think of special occasion food as being nutritious food. They think of foie gras, they think of lobster, they think of filet, or they think of top quality food made in, in very special ways that they can't get every day. So those are the kind of foods that we cook in fine dining as chefs, and that's what we're concerned about. In culinary education, we're concerned about teaching people how to cook well and how to, uh, to make food look good. In fact, when you Anyone that looks in any kind of culinary magazines or goes to fine dining establishments, the, the artistry of how we put it together on the plate or how we put it together in the presentation is often of the number two concern behind taste only. So that is very much a big concern again. So those are the reasons why we cook and there's more information on my PowerPoint. I don't want to take up the whole panel's time with my, my talk about this, but that's what I'm here for today and uh, I can answer any questions. Uh, may be pertaining to uh, professional culinary arts or pastry arts. Thank you. Now we had, oh, sorry, we had two individuals who were waiting to ask questions uh, with Professor Miller. If you want to go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, this, well, I can't tell. Uh, this is going to seem so much out of place in this new context, uh, but Dr. Miller, uh, your discussion of, uh, you know, biblical text and everything actually reminded me of one of my favorite uh, stories from the Bible, which is from Second Kings, where a city is besieged and the king realizes how bad it is when he's traveling the streets and comes across women arguing because uh, they'd agreed to cook and eat their babies and they'd eaten the first one and then the second woman hid hers and the woman whose baby had already been eaten was very upset. Uh, which sort of, <laughs> uh, which sort of brings me to uh, to my question, and it's something I posed uh, at the panel yesterday uh, in a more general sense. But it's 
the difference between you spoke a lot about symbolic, uh, symbolically eating people, uh, hosts, et cetera. What is the difference or similarity that you see between symbolically eating someone and actually eating someone? A big difference, actually. Okay, is this on? Can you hear this? Uh, that passage is horrific, and of course, it, it, who is it? It's Hezekiah, or is it, the king, he just rends his garments because he, he's not quite aware at how bad the state of, the, of his community was until he saw that argument. Um, if you want horror stories and f uh, real flesh eating, they are standard fare in any history of siege warfare. And uh, that's what populations under siege are re reduced to. So uh, it's grim. And, and nobody likes to talk about it and when it happens. And it features as chief curses. So the chief curse in, in Deuteronomy is that, th that you will be fighting over the afterbirth. You will be reduced to that. And it, it, the Lord will so set it up that you'll be besieged that you'll be, it, the mother will snatch it from her kids. And um, uh, yeah, so there's a big difference. The, the actual eating of, of, of humans under that situation is kind of the image of the world turned upside down, the ultimate uh, curse being brought to bear upon you. Um, but then why do we do it symbolically if it's so horrific? Um, because I guess all those kind of actions that are, uh, this is kind of trite, but it, and it's very general. But it's long time been noticed by anthropologists from the 19th century on that the difference between the holy and the, and the, the very sacred and the very polluting is very different. They each are highly contagious. Each are very dangerous. So if you get too near the Lord, you get zapped. If you look him in the face, you get zapped. If you try and stop the ark from falling in all good intentions, you get zapped. It's no different. The danger is no different than, than going over to the dark side and the dangers on that side. So there, it's again, this kind of ties in with like the word black and white coming from the same origin, the word guest and host coming from the same origin, and that, that, the, that this highly dangerousness of the holy and the unholy kind of tie up together too in a strange way. And how to keep them separate is very, you know, is, this tough stuff. I think so much of the biblical obsession with keeping things separate, not letting the linen get with the fibers separate, food separate, and stuff like that is acting out on that kind of just anxiety in some ways. But that's, you've asked a very complicated question. I'm just offering some stuff. Hi, and sorry, this is for Dr. Miller too. Um, you spoke a lot about um, the responsibility of guests to their Lord or their bread lord or their host, and then the responsibility that the host has to society from taking in the people. Um, but um, could you talk a little bit about the responsibility the host has as a host and sort of the social, when you talk about social control? Um, I, lived at, I, I lived in West Africa with a um, nomadic people who were normally nomadic. And um, the laws of hospitality are very, um, unwritten, but very strong even now, even now that most of them are no longer nomadic. I mean, the idea is, is that, you know, when, when you're a guest, there are obligations to the host that incur as, you know, as for your guests. So if you invite someone in as a guest, you know, there are certain um, rules about, you know, not killing them and <laughs> that sort of thing. Stronger than that, you have to guarantee their safety to the next place they go. Um, the, uh, uh, consider a universe in which there are no hotels or inns, and you're only, if you're a traveler, uh, the only place, it, it, it just becomes everybody plays in a sense, the innkeeper or the hotelier for, with regard to anybody who needs lodging. And if you turn people away without good excuse, you run afoul of the most central norm of, of that, that governs like inter, interpersonal relations. 
there are, I know that from the, in the medieval Icelandic laws, there's an absolute obligation that you put up any wayfarer who demands, who asks to be put up for three days. That's the max that they can uh, impose upon you. So if they stay after three days, you can toss them. Unless, I think, unless it's like a snowstorm or something like that. Um, but you, you, uh, there's just serious obligations to take them in. I mean, these things have broken down in our society because the market has intervened to, uh, to take away a big hunk of the problem by providing lodging everywhere. But if you think of how many of these uh, primitive customs the market has come in and provided a substitute, I'll give you one quick example. Uh, as you know, in, in blood feuding societies, you, you, you have to get paid, compensated for a loss of, 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 a, of a relative if they get killed. And that compensation could be in blood, you could take revenge, or they can just pay you sheep or cows, and you could be willing to accept some kind of uh, uh, other kind of compensation. It is that when people, were, uh, people expected to see something in return when they lost a loved one. And look how we are the same way and the life insurance companies have come in and, you know, you mean dad died and didn't pay the premiums? What the kind, hell kind of dad is that? And so you just kind of like, we, when, when, when the corpse is at hand, we expect, we accept some recompense. And now, we, when, when, in the 19th century, life insurance took off. There are several states in the United States that have few, refused to um, charter life insurance companies because they said, not incorrectly, it's just nothing more than blood money. One, one, one comment I would add to that, it, it, and I think it's a, an interesting question about the responsibilities of hosts, is that there are also passages in the the Bible that, that go to great lengths to emphasize how important it is to, to play host to guest. And one of them happens really early in the Bible, um, which is uh, the, the, the figure Abraham is, is a, after he becomes an adult and is first addressed by God in the Bible, um, ends up having lots of conversations with God off and on as time goes on. And there's one scene where he's in this heated conversation with God and these three figures who are, I guess are supposed to be angels or whatever they are, these three, these three characters appear out of nowhere in the desert and appear in his doorstep and God's in the middle of saying something to Abraham and Abraham says, hold that thought God, I'll, I'll be right back with you but I have guests now and I have to go and he cuts God off mid-sentence and goes to go deal with his with his guests, which I guess is taken uh, to the point is that the lesson is there's nothing more important than playing host to your guests, including like, you know, talking to God. And I always thought that was, that was a pretty impressive uh, passage. Yeah, I, I just thought, I, I spent some time in Mongolia, and there, even in a modern society, because it, they still are nomadic, and people still live in dairy, and they still have their own things, Or if you don't mind, I have some very uh, strong thoughts as someone whose uh, profession is as a host. And the dynamic between host and guest in, in this country, um, because we're not so bound in, in tradition, is, is fairly blurred. And I think it's extremely common for host, neither host nor guest, to know how to really um, deal with that relationship. And um, I, I think, you know, I, I say this all the time as a, as a chef, and I, I, you may disagree with me, but uh, when people come into what my wife and I call the theater of dining, it's the everything. And I have a lot of anecdotes to back this up, but if, if the food is great, but the atmosphere and the service are lacking, 
that restaurant generally is not going to make it. If the food is relatively mediocre, good, you don't poison anyone, you don't disgust anybody, but you have great service and great atmosphere, that restaurant generally will have a long lifespan. But, but specifically about the relationship between guest and host, um, people, I, I know it goes both ways, but from my point of view, because I'm, you know, I, I'm uh, uh, often um, aghast at what I see from the guest point of view, um, what people demand uh, on the host, sometimes it's pretty incredible. <laughs> and, uh, How do you keep from taking it, revenge? It, it, it's <laughs> exactly, it, and it's... Um, you'd mentioned earlier that <clears throat> the hierarchy in a kitchen was patterned after the French military and I'm familiar with the hierarchy in the military and how one moves between those grades, but if you would describe um, the hierarchy of the kitchen and how the movement between that okay. uh, goes. I'll give Thank you, you. A, like a quick breakdown. In the French system, you start at the very bottom with what they'd call the plongeur, which is just like it sounds, the plunger. And then after that, you have the comi, which is the cook. And then after comi, you have a chef de partie of different stations, a saucier, a pâtissière, a um, and then you have uh, sous chef, and then you have uh, executive shoes, uh, sous chefs or chef de cuisine, and then the executive chef. When we get someone new, and I, I always go through and I, I talk to people new, we're, we have a very formal kitchen. No one in our restaurant speaks to someone else in that restaurant without asking to speak with them. It's a call system. And so even if I go to a dishwasher and I say, Zach, may I call? And Zach will say, yes, chef, what is it? And then I'll say what I, what I want to say. And afterwards, uh, it's always thank you. I always use uh, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I try to get everyone in the kitchen to do that, but it's sometimes there's only a certain amount of control that you can exert without a mutiny. And so, um, <laughs> um, but to say if a dishwasher comes to me and says, chef, may I call? And I says, what is it? And he says, can you tell me where the simple green is? I'm like, what? So you can ask, you don't go when you're on a, on a battlefield and you're a private and you're looking for ammunition, you don't go bother a general. And it's not a, a point of being pretentious, it's because I have a million things that I'm trying to deal with, and if everyone comes to that person with their questions when anyone down that hierarchical lineage can deal with it, it, it just it's not, doesn't make any sense. And so, you, so everyone has to go to the person above them always, whether it's a, a problem or something they need, or something they're looking for, then that person goes to the next person up if they feel like the next person up needs to hear about it. And uh, there are certain things I want to hear about, um, maybe specific techniques, or this product is, uh, products are constantly degrading when you get them, as this product, how close is it to degradation that we're no longer going to use it, and it becomes compost or, or whatever, but that it has to come up through a hierarchy, otherwise it's just mayhem. Does that answer your Um, you probably know more. I'm, I, I should also state, I am not a trained chef. I'm more of a hack. Um, <laughs> I have a master's in fine arts, and uh, um, Chef Pliska could tell you infinitely more about that brigade system, I'm sure, than, than I can. Well, you, uh, chef, chef Jonathan hit it pretty much on the head. He missed, missed one, one position that, that is very paramount for the whole culinary experience for, for training, and that's the apprentice position, which is even below the, the, the first position that you mentioned. And it depends on, it depends really on, on where, you're, where you're working and what kind of establishment you're in. Where, where Chef Jonathan is, in, he's in a, a, very, a very fine dining restaurant, has a has certain amount of positions, but if you're in, in a larger atmosphere where you have banquets, catering, uh, three or four different kitchens to run at the same time, you have even more, more positions than, than what he said. But the, the, one of the main reasons the brigade system is set up is just like he said. If, if I have four kitchens running, and so like today we have 20 functions going on today. When I leave here, I have five functions going on in four different locations. To, to the people that are coming to those functions, it's the most important thing of that night. To me, all of those functions and everybody in the kitchen, all the people bringing the food out and everything in between is all important. So. So it's imperative to, to realize that the brigade system and why it's set up is an organizational system, just like on a battlefield, just like he was saying. You can't answer everyone's questions, so you have, kind of have to go up the chain of command or down the chain of command. 
So if, if, if the dishwasher wants to come to me and ask me where the pot soap is, or the simple green, what he's saying, or that basically he uses that to clean ovens with, but it's a cleaning product. If he wants to ask me in the middle of a plate up, and I'm plating up for, let's say, uh, the president of the university, and uh, uh, I don't know, the, a dignitary from China, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing and go find the pot soap for the, for the pots, even though I'd like to, you know, we just, we just can't. We only, we can, we can, our, our, our minds can only work on so many things. So that's why, it's, that's why the brigade system was, was set up. And it's, it's, it's different for different places. Some places will have uh, executive chef, then they'll have a chef de cuisine, which is over the kitchen, or whatever that kitchen is. They'll have uh, executive sous chef, they'll have banquet chefs, they'll have garmage chefs, which are in charge of the cold food kitchens. They'll have, they'll have a, pastry, a pastry chef, and, and they'll have their own brigade, like if you were to go to uh, uh, a major resort in, in Vegas, for example, there's sometimes 30 people working in the, in the pastry kitchen. And, and so that's just pastry side, then you have the, the bakers and so on and so forth. So it can branch out. But the brigade system, what, what, uh, what the Chef John was talking about, is, is still very much alive today and in, 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 in is, is needed just because of that organization. I'm going to give you a very, very short anecdotal story. Um, someone I know, a friend of mine, uh, not that long ago, 10 years ago, was uh, working at a Ritz-Carlton down in Naples, Florida, and has wor worked his way up to the main dining room, which was a big deal. And he found himself on the service elevator with the executive chef of the resort. And he turned to the chef and he said, uh, Chef, do you think we'll be busy tonight? And the chef was a hardcore French chef, and he says, what's your name? He says, Scott Warren, sir. And the guy doesn't say anything. The next day, he'd been busted down to flipping burgers on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I wanted to kind of expand the uh, discussion about, um, about guests and hosts to the, uh, to, to the three members of the panel who have done a lot of um, food serving for people who are not in their family. And that includes, of course, Shirley Courier, who um, cooked for boys at a boarding school. Um, and I, I guess I, I heard this really fascinating um, anecdote. I can't remember who told me this story, but. Um, somebody was eating dinner at a restaurant in London with a group of, uh, this is an American, eating with a group of people who were British. And at the end of the evening, there was leftover food and he asked for it to be boxed up. And the British people he was sitting with were absolutely horrified that he would have such bad manners. And you know, here in America, we say, always say that you shouldn't let food go to waste. And so there's something uh, somewhat ethical about boxing up um, leftover food. And they said, well, would you take that food home if you were in somebody's home? Um, and I just, I, that, that was fascinating to me and made me think a lot about what the relationship is of eating in somebody else's establishment. Um, Shirley Courier, of course, in your case, this was a home for the people who you were uh, cooking for. And I'm wondering, I guess, how the experience of feeding them yes. made that more into a home and what the two restaurateurs think about the, the role that money plays in the sort of exchange of food to customers. Uh, meals were actually very formal, and there was a headmaster at each table, and all the plates were stacked in front of him and the food around him, and he served each plate and passed it down. And so um, as long as we could, um, I used my sterling silver, uh, and we had, you know, the best uh, I had a knockdown drag out with the health inspector over my covered sugar dish. Uh, he demanded that we replace it with a cylinder with a hole in it, which uh, my ex-husband was furious over. But um, anyhow, uh, we finally had to give in to the cylinder with a hole in the center. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it seems to me, by the way, on that, it, it seems to me that the cylinder with a hole in it is uh, much more ripe for cross contamination than a spoon. Absolutely, because you're much more likely to put your finger on it or absolutely. Touch it That's uh, what I kept explaining, and he he couldn't understand that you use the sugar shell, the fluted spoon, in the sugar dish to spoon the sugar out and not to lick. <laughs> but you know, but you do bring up something. This also goes within societal rules. What people understand and don't understand. There's a reason I don't eat at buffets 
And because in my head, I'm thinking that you're talking about the anatomy of disgust, the person in front of me, and I go into restrooms all the time, like we all do, and how many people I know about women, but men that go into the bathroom and don't wash their hands. So I'm imagining the guy that's gone through the line in front of me, has hepatitis, just went and, I'm sorry, had a bowel movement, and then didn't wash his hands. He's come out, he's touched those spoons, and you get to the end, and even though you're using tongs to pick up the spring rolls in the end, you go back to your table, you pick the spring roll up with your hand, you eat it, that's why I don't eat at buffets. <laughs> but, but if you start thinking like that, you go crazy. Because, I mean, every once in a while I get this thing, like, I just washed my hands after going to the bathroom, and now I'm going to touch the door knob on the way out of the bathroom. And you, and you start saying, you can't think about it. Or you start, like, walking around. And so I know people who actually take a piece of, of, of the, the hand-drying towel <laughs> and, and then open the door like that, and then are walking down the hall with that. Yeah. And you don't yeah. want to touch you know, them after they've touched I, that. I, always, I tell my staff always, by the way, in our, bath, in, in our restaurant, you come out of the bathroom, because we're a small establishment, we don't have separate employee bathrooms. You come out of that bathroom, you come out with a paper towel, and that way anyone waiting does not have to guess whether you wash your hands or not. <laughs> <laughs> no one has ever asked. If, if, the, if, the, if the trash bucket is not next to the doorknob, I'm looking for a receptacle after I get out. I'm, I, I'm not that OCD, really. <laughs> I shake hands with people. Um, I had a question since we have the opportunity to ask people who are involved in food preparation. Um, I was reading uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's Eating Animals book, and he talked about something a lot of people talk about, which is that we're overfishing the oceans. And I know, Chef Jonathan, you said that you don't serve a lot of fish, but I just thought since we have three people here who have a history of you know, of cooking, um, the, you know, he makes a point that the overfishing leads us to eat different fish than we'd eaten in the past. And what's kind of interesting about that, I mean, he makes the point in an interesting way, and he says, who of us knows, you know, what fish our grandparents were eating? And I do remember, I mean, I have some childhood memories of being served particular kinds of fish that I don't see anymore. And so I guess my question is specifically, if you've noticed that change, if there are different fish that you're preparing today than you've prepared before, and if that's a kind of a consequence to your knowledge of the overfishing problem. I'm gonna say something real quick, and I don't, mean to, I don't mean to jump in on this, but I literally do not serve seafood. My background is as a seafood chef. Um, we decided when we did the drugstore that we were going to make a point about we literally are not going to serve seafood, and I do serve fish and I serve uh, sustainably raised, non-GMO fed freshwater fish. Um, but I'll guarantee you that uh, my parents did not eat seared tuna <laughs> and uh, my grandparents did not. And, it, and it's funny, I think in San Francisco that things like uh, ling cod and rock cod and, um, and um, sand dabs, which are extremely out of vogue uh, from probably the 60s until just recently, are now popular because they're sustainable. Things like uh, sardines and mackerels and anchovies are all uh, sustainable. Shad, I, mean, I think you're seeing a lot more of those. I think the, uh, the large tunas and the, um, I mean, even in my short cooking span, I've seen where the tunas that are available at markets have gotten precipitously smaller, so much so that you're getting down to where the removing tunas from the ocean are not even of reproductive age. And again, that goes back to the term not sustainable. And so that's, uh, um, that's why I don't serve them. If I could add to that, um, a story, I'm from the Virginia, uh, Washington DC area. And when I, when I was young cooking, we used to cook a fish called uh, uh, rockfish, uh, Chesapeake Bay sea bass. And um, when we used to get them, this was in Maryland in the DC area, this was a major fish. I mean, everybody had it you know, from the fine dining restaurants down to the more uh, mediocre, if you will, establishments, and, and, and everybody ate it. It's a delicious fish. I don't know if, you've, if you've had, anyone here has had it before. For more than 15 years, we couldn't get that fish. It was, it was almost fished out. So they, 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 now, because of sustainability practices, that's back. But the, the, the main thing that I, in my research, and I do see, see, serve seafood, and a lot of it, in a lot of different kinds, but we try to serve fish that's sustainable fish, and a lot of the fish that used to be what would people call, what call junk fish is now you're seeing in the center of the plate because the tuna, like, like Chef Jonathan was saying, and tuna, tuna 
uh, sea bass, swordfish, certain fish or, and, and red, red snappers, they're not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not around that much. And they're, and they're being fished out in a lot of different areas. And just because of the sushi craze, bringing on sushi, because of uh, obviously the nutritional value and just the world population boom, if you will, and how many people that are eating the fish, I mean, our oceans are only so big. So s most people are trying to serve farm seafood, but even farm seafood you have to be careful of because just because it's farm doesn't necessarily mean it's good, okay? There's, there's, there's salmon, if you will, that's, that's fed, fed uh, a certain feed that is not good for you, and the, and the salmon are colored with certain things, and, 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 they, can, and they can actually... Uh, infest other ecosystems with diseases from, from where they raise their fam salmon. So there are, there's a lot of, of research on that uh, through the Chef's Collaborative, through uh, Monterey Bay uh, Aquariums. Uh, uh, there's a new f book called The Four Fish. I think Michael Ginsburg might have been written, but I, I'm not positive about that. But that was just came out on the New York Times bestseller list. Talks about the four main f species of tuna, uh, sea bass, cod, and uh, I'm not sure what the other fish is, but, but there's a lot to be said for that, and as for a seafood lover and person who cooks seafood, a lot of fish are not around, and they will not be around in the future. That's why you see fish like barramundi, you see, uh, you see a certain uh, farm-raised uh, trout and farm-raised fish like that, and there's a lot of different fish like that that people are serving, but a lot of the, the wild fish is, is either gone or, or, or difficult to find. One last thing about the farm-raised um, they are you know, in these, they have these huge pens, and I may be um, patronizing everybody here, but they have these massive pens out on the ocean, and they have these blowers, and they blow seafood pellets, and they have hormones and antibiotics, and, and as you uh, kind of uh, uh, indicated, they, they have dye in them. Otherwise, the, without the krill, the salmon won't have a pink flesh. It would be gray. And it's not just that salmon. What happens is because these are open to the ecosystems, you have migratory fish that swim by these giant pens, and where there's an easy food supply, they're going to linger. So these, these migratory fish get antibiotics, and just like we do, if we take antibiotics, and even going aside from the uh, possibility that we're diluting our own uh, potential welfare with overuse of antibiotics in farm animals, the other issue is these migratory fish coming in, having antibiotics in their uh, subtherapeutic diet, and then going on into their uh, migration and then running into bacteria and having mass die-offs. And so it's more than just, I don't want to eat that salmon, it's other species that are, that are being destroyed through it also. I wanted to follow up on Dr. Breslin's talking about homeostasis and some of, some of the, that kind of core notion with uh, Professor Miller's stuff about community. I was intrigued by his sense about the 40 axemen on, on the uh, <coughs> Viking ship and like these thugs basically invented rules so they could sleep at night. And in fact, it was the thugs. I'm thinking about, for instance, right now, most of the social justice things instituted in the New Deal were actually by the thugs because until they went along, we didn't have workman's comp and a whole bunch of other kind of things. Liking this whole idea of there's a human body for human homeostasis and then the idea of communities and what maintains homeostasis and whether that concept is useful. And you made the comment about the fundamental moral principle is repayment of debt. And I'm wondering whether a lot of things you talked about amounted to repayment of debt as kind of this regulatory system in some sense, especially in small groups, 500 or less, to maintain some kind of internal homeostasis, which was essential for that group's, you know, survival, and whether that's where a lot of the the, the rules kind of come from. And then the other thing for all of you is, so how many of you watched the the Grand Chef series on TV? You know what that is? Oh, this is about a, a, a Korean. Uh, it's it's out of Korea. It's about how are we going to send Korean cuisine worldwide. If you haven't seen it, then you can't comment. But that I, I was at, I adored the series. It's too bad it's over. Um, the, the word, it, it, it'll get me back to some words. The word for um, justice 
in most of the Indo-European languages and even the Semitic languages always means it, it's something about getting even, about evenness. And so the, the balance on the, the, that the iconic figure of Lady Justice is holding scales, uh, those are not to determine guilt or innocence, those are to determine exactly as the scales would in the marketplace when a bargain's been struck, and that means they have to be level. So it's, a, it's, it's like when you know that the one side that wronged the other has, has to compensate the other side for what the harms they caused. So it's like to restore, in Greek, the translation of, is to get back the equal, to, restore, to achieve the balance again. So yeah, the homeostatic um, model is very much in, in, engaged in what our notion of uh, justice, to justify a margin, to make it even, evenness, justness. Um, in the Semitic language, it's, it's straight, right. Um, we never think of that which is right or just as being oblique or crooked. Wrong, and, and the word wrong in Norse just simply means to meander. It's, it's a name often given to rivers, the wrong river. And right means straight. And notice how all the words we use as little word uh, to get our conversation kind of exactly right are like these little filler words, like right, like right, or like even so, or just so all mean restoring the balance? I, I, I'm not entirely sure just to, I, mean, I don't know if you want me to respond to that or not. It'll just be bull whatever I say anyway, but um, uh, if, if you recall the four principles that Walter Cannon put up there, um, I can't recall them so you can help me out here, but um, the, the, Walter Cannon pick, picked up on, on um, the, 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 uh, the idea of homeostasis and came up with these four principles that had to do with um, wanting to maintain order, knowing that when there's something happening, there has to be a counter response and counter regulata regulation, that it has to be a complicated system. It's going to take many things to maintain this. They're all going to work in coordination, and this has to be an intentional system that's created to maintain that. These are his four principles of homeostasis. And the, the only thing I can say by way of tying that in with, with uh, justice and some social thing is that I read an, an article that I thought was really great, and I can't remember where I read it. It was either in the, the New Yorker magazine or the magazine of the New York Times, one of those two. I always conflate them in my head because I read them both simultaneously. But it was an article about the Yakuza and someone who had spent a lot of time studying it and living with the, the, the Japanese criminal system. And it was really enlightening to me because I always envisioned them um, being some sort of modern day samurai and being ultra violent and living this sort of like gangs of New York kind of like hatchet warfare uh, type thing. And what he said was that there's almost no violence at all whatsoever among the Yakuza. That people never get hurt. That the violence is always implied but that their system is so regulated and full of so much order and so much like, you know, this happens, so that has to happen, and this kind of, um, you know, debts have to be repaid, but the violence is always implied, and, and it's such an incredibly regulated and ordered system that there's, there's no need for violence. And that so if, if, if someone does something to someone else where, where you need to, like, go whack someone, Everybody knows that this person's in trouble and needs to be done. So there's the implication that this person would need to be whacked, and they actually never are whacked. What they do is they go and you know give this other person a million dollars and ask for forgiveness for not being whacked, and it's never done. But the implication is there, and it's just. And so I think that it they they actually live by like you know if I can assert this, this makes no sense. But they li let me just say this for the sake of saying it. They live by Cannon's four orders of homeostasis. Prove that wrong. How's that? <laughs> well, 
Well, I think there is the anticipation of violence. So there's one anecdote they give there is that, you know, if things escalate to a point of no return, then it ultimately results in violence. But, but they'll, you know, they'll, they'll want to go to a bank and extort money from it. And the bank will know that if they don't give money over, that like someone's going to be killed. And it's like, you know, money for life. And so there's the, there's the implication there that, you know, someone's going to get hurt. And so they'll go to the bank confronting them to extort money from them. And if the bank doesn't give, they won't kill someone. What they'll do is they'll, they'll have like a bunch of Yakuza guys go stand in front of the bank and maybe like, you know, hang a dead fish on the door um, as a warning to them. If they still don't give money, they'll gather together like 300 Yakuza who will go get in line to like open new accounts in the bank. And they will occupy every single spare moment of every teller in the bank all day long, opening new accounts, where they'll open the account for one dollar. And eventually the bank will, you know, and if this kept escalating up, eventually they would kill someone. But eventually the bank just says, all right, screw it. Like, we don't want anyone to get hurt, and you're obviously not going to give up. Here's your money. But the implication is, is so it is, it, there's, this, there's this anticipation of what's coming, but they never get there. I just was wondering if um, Daniel, you, and uh, Jonathan could talk a little bit about ch the challenges with um, kind of reconciling running a restaurant where you're relying on what's available. Like I like the Clay County model. I work for University Extension, and so I understand what that's like. But then reconciling that with the fact that you have patrons who are coming wanting to eat particular things, and, and that might not be what is the model, and, and what are the challenges of that? You know, for me, uh, what I'm doing is very, very personal. I don't do classic dishes. I'm only doing my, my own compositions, and so not everyone's going to like what I do, and I understand that. There's, uh, I'm not trying to reach the, large, the, the broadest base of a demographic, and and actually, and to do that, you know, my wife and I have made a lot of sacrifices. Um, and, uh, Chef Dan was, Daniel was talking about the monetary need. Uh, and there is a monetary need, and we need to do what we do. We have to stay open. But um, five years into this, I don't, I don't take a salary. And my wife doesn't take a salary. And she does all the books. Uh, she does all of the uh, payroll. And we live on her tips. And to do this, by doing this, we can pay our staff a reasonable wage and provide health insurance. And also by doing that, we can serve really, really high level of an ingredients that are articulated in um, uh, very uh, fine, you know, trying to articulate food very uh, expertly and serving at a price that is not normal, I'd like to think, for the kind of food that we're serving. And so within that, what I ask of people is that if someone's coming to the restaurant, it takes a certain amount of submission because you are coming to our vision. And I have on my menu, and I've got a lot of flack for this, about uh, due to the integrity of the dishes, please do not, we don't allow for substitutions. These dishes, to me, I have dishes that have taken, I've got dishes that have taken three years for me to, to be able to put together and articulate and to get out. And, and they're very, very personal to me. And if someone doesn't want to see my vision, then I, I feel that maybe we're not the right place for them to be. And, and I'm willing to, um, to take that cut in business to, um, you know, to do what I want. As a painter, when I was a painter, if, I mentioned earlier, if someone said, I'm gonna pay you a lot of money to uh, paint something to match my couch, and like, I'm, I'm not the person for that, someone else. I just, here's a, maybe a little bit different. I just got offered um, a few weeks ago it was a great deal, $5,000 for four hours work. Uh, it was a uh, company, a PR company out of Chicago. They said, we represent Kingsford. You have to come down to this parking lot. There's going to be a lot of media there, and you're going to have a cook-off against another chef in Kansas City. We're doing this in only six cities, and then you have a 50% chance of winning, obviously. We're going to fly you to New York, and if you win in New York, we're going to give you another $5,000 and donate $5,000 to your um, favorite charity. I says, wow, that sounds fabulous. Who else is involved? He said, well, Coca-Cola is involved, and it'll be in a Walmart parking lot using Walmart beef. <laughs> it's like, I've never dreamed of making $5,000 in four hours. But I, 
there's a price, and it's beyond that money, you know. So. Can I, uh, can I talk a little bit about the, the, challenge, the challenge point that you asked? The whole farm-to-table movement, in, in my estimation, and in in what we do, and what I see in, 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 in just the times of the professional kitchens and that whole movement, you know, it comes, and I'm sure, you know, the, uh, many of you would agree, it comes from a long time ago when it was natural to eat what was grown around you. I mean, they didn't have the kind of transportation they'd had. People were, ate the food that was grown there, and that's what they ate. Well, well, nowadays, when people come to, like, my restaurant, we have events, and they say, okay, we have a, we're going to do these three banquets, and we have four or 500 people, and it's, uh, let's say, December, and we want to have all local food products, and we want to have all organically grown local produce in December in Missouri. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So we, we do what we can. And, and we, do, we, we try to bring in the food that's local and try to do the most we can, but there's a, there's a big problem with that. And that's what, you know, you have, you have the two things. You have one, the supply and demand problem, getting, getting the food there and what's grown in the areas to, to feed all these people that want to eat it. And then you have also the, the, the problem of, of corporations don't want you, don't want a lot of this, these movements to go forward. And so there's a lot of issues on that side, too. I won't get into in, in a short time period because I might talk too long. But, but there, there is issues on both of those sides. So supply and demand and getting the food there that the, the customer wants, if, if, it's, if it's locally grown, sustainable, and the farm-to-table uh, type of agenda, well, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to get those kinds of foods in the amount of quantities that, that we need to be able to feed the amount of people that we need to feed. And that's, that's generally speaking, too, because when, when, I work with the school systems and so on and so forth, and a lot of them talk about the same things, but you, know, you, have to, it's, you can't get the kind of things to feed the amount of people that need to be fed and all be local, sustainable, you know, farm-to-table type, type food. It just doesn't happen. I'd like to add to that, though, that that's, and with all due respect, I think you're talking about working within a current construct and with the infrastructure that we have in place. I don't think it necessarily has to be true. I think that uh, the pipelines of subsidy have gone all the wrong ways, and, and they've created the dynamic of cheap fuel and, and the monocrop system that allows to do the feedlots and, and to have all the, the cheap corn to feed the animals that are giving us the, the horrible ratios of uh, um, low-density lipids, high-density lipids that are giving us diabetes and heart disease and, and all that's involved in that we pay for on the back end to get that 99-cent burger, and this has all been documented extensively. Obviously, I'm not saying anything new. But I think as a society, we have to f decide how, what are the true costs of our food? And, and how do we want to facilitate a way to get the true cost in line so that the small local farmer doing hoop houses in Missouri can work and develop the co-oping warehousing that it's going to take. I mean, the way it is right now, if you're gonna use small farmers, then someone like what, what Chef Pliska is doing will decimate an entire crop from a farmer in one meal. But when you start grouping and, and co-oping lots of these small farmers together with central warehousing, and instead of I have in my restaurant right now, we're working with probably 30 farmers and they're probably 10 really serious farm-to-table restaurants in Kansas City. And you add up the number of trips a week, that's 300 trips and all the carbon footprint and all the time it takes for me to bring in each of these different farmers, things that they're bringing to me, and for them to go out to all these different places. If all those farmers, 30 of them are going to one warehouse and then dropping and then having one truck go out and go to 10 different restaurants, you've taken 300 stops down to 40, and you're, you're starting to allow a system where multi-unit uh, restaurants and larger operations can work with small operating farmers. If I can add to that, I, I agree with what you're saying 100%. The, the, the problem is with that, it just, it's just um, it's difficult to, to, uh, to get people to pay for that, and, and it'll take a time to get to that. I mean, I'm, I'm all for the urban agriculture and people growing their own food, and I think as chefs, at least in my role, I, I try to cook as natural as we can. I try to teach people how to eat natural food, unprocessed food. But let's talk about an organic chicken that costs $18 for one chicken. How many people in our society can afford to pay, at this point, $18 for one chicken? They can't. And that's, that's on the other, the, other, the other side of it. The restaurants you're talking about and the people that I serve, they can afford it and they'll do it. But the average people that are dining out there or, or eating, they can't afford to eat the kind of way the, the foods that, 
that are being produced now. So that's, that's another one of the issues. So I think we all need to think about that and move towards that. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have the long-term health problems like we have now and so on and so forth. But it's, it's a, a mon monumental issue that uh, it's going to take a lot of time. Yeah. Whether we're going to pay on the front or we're going to pay on the right. back. It, it costs to produce the food regardless. Yeah. And I think that's going to lead into your topic tomorrow morning. Is that, is that not right? We're, can we, can um, we ask one more question? Let's try to keep it to just a couple of minutes in the, in the question and answer, and that'll end up our, our I'll day. keep my part short. Um, perhaps this goes back to gluttony, um, <laughs> perhaps not. Uh, maybe notions of you know, purity and who knows. But I, I wondered if, if you all, all of you could speak to the notion of um, eating and, and kind of gorging. We, we all know that eating one potato chip is not pleasurable. Eating potato chips is pleasurable if you eat the whole bag and maybe a second bag. <laughs> eating cookies is the same way. Eating one cookie is one thing. You need about six or seven to kind of really get going for that to be pleasurable. A lot of really good food is the same way. Eating barbecue, you don't eat one rib. You eat a whole rack of ribs, and then you just push back from the table and you go take a nap. Um, what, what, what is that? What, what, what accounts for that? Why, um, and why does that get demonized? And can you think of any instances in which, sorry, in which eating just a very little bit is, is uh, eating just a very little bit of something that is delicious or pleasurable is, is enough and is satisfying and, and we don't, we don't crave more. We don't crave that that idea of, of, of gorging on the thing until we've had our fill. 30, in 30 seconds each, because we want to leave them craving more so they come back well, tomorrow. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that with a, with a very quick quote um, to, to invoke once again the great Julia Child. So she caught a lot of flack for uh, telling people to make you know, a chocolate cake that had half a dozen eggs in it and a pound of butter in it and so on and so forth. And her, her response, and you know, lots of chocolate, and her response was very simple, and I think it's very much true. And her quote is, a small piece of chocolate cake tastes just the same as a large piece of chocolate cake. And that's all I'll say. A small piece of very good chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't, serve, I don't serve foie gras because no one locally is producing it, but I don't know if anyone's ever tried to sit down and eat an entire lobe of foie gras. I think that kind of is the same thing. It's a little goes a long ways. But if you ever noticed that if it were just a matter of taste, if taste were just the pleasure, you could get pleasure by just chewing something and spitting it out. That doesn't work, does it? You have to swallow. And I mean, so it's more than just the taste. You want to also have the feeling of it starting to fill you up. And you want to have the feeling of satedness at some point down the line. And one potato chip won't do that. I, I'd just like to add, in my understanding of the word gourmet and gourmand, there's two, uh, the, from my understanding of the word, gourmet is a person who loves to eat fine dining and eat well. A gourmand is someone who is gluttonous and eats to excess. I think that as a society, especially in our society right now in this country, there's a lot of things that are success, uh, uh, excess, and it's not just food. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Let's give them a hand. Thank you.